Well, today we're going to be turning to a passage of Scripture to which we will return next Sunday for Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 29. Next week we'll read on through verse 30. Today just through 29 as we look towards Holy Week and Good Friday. Hear now God's word. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding region. And he was teaching in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he, Jesus, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he rose to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the blind recovery of sight, to send out the oppressed in freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after rolling up the scroll and giving it back to the attendant, he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were testifying well of him and marveling at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not the son of Joseph? So he said to them, you will surely quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your own hometown too. Then he said, truly, amen, I say to you that no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. But Elijah was sent to none of them, but instead to a woman, a widow in Zarephath of Sidon. Also, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with rage, and rising up, they drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. This is the original cliffhanger, if you'll forgive me on that. Uh, you will, will arrive at the denouement of this story and what happens with Jesus next week. We'll read on through verse 30. Now, don't go ahead and read verse 30 yet. We'll save that for Resurrection or Easter Sunday. But today, as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture, which is central to understanding who Jesus is, it's the passage in which Jesus makes very clear his messianic manifesto, what he's doing, what his mission is, what it means to be with him, what the implications are. We are dealing here today with what could be called immediately together, best and worst sermon ever. Best and worst 
sermon ever. Now, the people in the Nazareth synagogue made their decision on which way to go on this, best or worst ever. But what I have to tell you today is you yourself, I don't care whether you're 10 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 80 years old, you and I need to make our decision too. Is this best ever or worst ever? Where are you in your response to the Messiah, to the servant, to the King, to the Son of God, Jesus? It's a jarring passage to read if you've never encountered it before because it seems like everybody just thinks they're just applauding Jesus, isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? They're testifying to him. And apparently Luke is not. I don't think Luke is being ironic there. They are, they are clearly in favor of him up to a point and it turns fast. You ever been in a situation where the crowd turns fast? Where even supposedly religious people turn fast? Well, well that's what we have going on here. And Part of what's happening here, this is not all of what's happening here, but part of this clearly relates to another point of reference that Jesus gives us to spiritual life and faith and discerning assembled groups of so-called religious people and where your heart and soul are. Jesus tells a couple of parables that are set forth in Luke chapter 5. They're kind of a lodestar point of reference, north star point of reference. One is about old cloth. You can't put new cloth on old garment. And then he goes on and tells another parable. He says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And he goes on and he says this, and no one after drinking the old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. This is one dimension of what we're dealing with here. Have you ever been around people in general or even religious people, maybe even, God forbid, church people who are really tied to exactly the way they've always done it and this is the way we do it and this is what I like to sing and this is what I like. And In other words, their religion or their church is about them not almighty living God. Have you ever been around folks like that before? You know what? We all kind of tend to lean in that direction in our flesh at various points in our lives, right? Uh, Jesus says if we drink the old wine and basically are addicted to the old wine, get drunk all the time and satisfied, and isn't it mellow and nice on the old wine, we'll never want the new. There actually has to be a radical break. It's almost like God had to send his own son into the world to interrupt our little human endeavors and our human religion and save us from ourselves. You know, that's part of what's going on here. So Jesus says, look, if you keep drinking the old wine and sticking to this is the way I like it, this is the way I want it, and if you even... God forbid, take that hellish tendency into coming before the Lord in worship and worship yourself and your own druthers instead of what God wants, including new things. You're going to miss the one, Jesus, who says in the book of Revelation, behold, I make everything new. There's a lot of people who claim they want to go to heaven that actually won't know part of heaven because Jesus says in heaven, I make everything new. And we're going to have folks that are saying, no, 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 I want it the old way. I like the old wine. It's nice. It's comfortable. So into our passage today, Jesus returned. Where did he return from? Well, it's what we just read last Sunday and preached about. Jesus is testing in the wilderness by the devil. Remember last week's sermon? Catch it. If you, if you missed it, it's, it's online. Answering the devil. So Jesus has now returned from, you know, fasting and being tempted, tested by the desert, by the devil in the desert for um, 40 days. So Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. He doesn't notice this go down to Jerusalem. He goes up to Galilee. We are entering phase one of Jesus' public ministry, which is going to be centered in Galilee. 
not in Jerusalem. He'll go down to Jerusalem uh, for feast. Uh, We know that from John's gospel, but he's primarily in Galilee. And he's going to range out to the Decapolis to Gentile areas too, shockingly. So there Jesus began his public ministry. Now, one thing I want to remind us of, Luke is very specific on this. This is the running theme so far in the first several chapters of Luke. We are supposed to pay attention to being and living in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not suddenly emerge as the third person of the Trinity in the Acts of the Apostles. Yes, I know we get Pentecost and there's a lot of focus on the Spirit in the Acts of the Apostles, but we're being told repeatedly by Luke that Jesus is moving and acting in the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember, we talked about that and noticed this last week, the incarnate Son of God, who has emptied himself, becoming one of us, is the faithful one of us, fully human, who is led by the Holy Spirit into the testing in the desert. The Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form when Jesus is praying after the baptism. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus and guides Jesus as one of us. Remember, we talked about this last week. He doesn't call on his God cards. He doesn't turn the stone into bread. He could do it. He's tempted far more than I ever would be because he has all this power that he can avail himself of, but he doesn't do it because he's going there as our representative and ultimately our mediator and our advocate. So remember, he's moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're being told, well, this continues in his teaching and preaching ministry in the Galilee. So he returns in the power of the Spirit. Again, as our representative, not in his own power. Likewise, he's not going to say, well, I'll tell you exactly when the end is. He's going to say, I'm waiting on the Father. So he's yielding himself humbly as our Savior, fully human as well as fully divine. Okay? So, so he's, he's ministering in the power of the Spirit and by God's Word, in obedience to God's Word. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and he began his public ministry doing a couple of things. What? Leading a political revolution, obviously, right? Let's get the Romans out of here. He'll form maybe a military and lead the great revolution. Is that what he does in the power of the Holy Spirit? Now that he's in the power of the Spirit, picking on the people that he doesn't like, is that what he does? No. What does he do? Well, it's kind of low-key. You know, John's going to get upset about this after a while. John, son of Zechariah. Jesus began his public ministry doing a couple things. Teaching, which Luke really wants to emphasize. The teaching of God's word is the centerpiece of Jesus' ministry. Yes, he's going to do miracles. I'll get to that in a moment. But the centerpiece is the teaching, the preaching, the proclamation, and also healing. We, We can know that from the way Jesus talks in this sermon. I can tell you that in Matthew and Mark's gospel, Jesus, they make clear that Jesus doesn't go to Nazareth for a while. In other words, in in Luke allows this, Luke understands this, Jesus is now a celebrity when he comes back to Nazareth. He's been ministering for months, healing people, teaching amazing, amazingly with authority in Galilee, and then he's going to come back home. Now, I've mentioned to you before the parallelism that we're supposed to catch the difference between John, son of Zechariah, commonly known as John the Baptist, and Jesus, Son of God. Good commentators typically focus on us on this in chapters 1 and 2, because it's a big deal in 1 and 2. But it's clear that this parallelism continues through chapters 3, I mentioned that the last couple sermons, and chapter 4. We have it here in 4, by implication. Notice this. The people needed to go out to John, son of Zechariah. You may remember John is out in the wilderness and then he's out at the Jordan River. If you want to hopefully get yourself in motion in the direction of God's salvation and God's good news, you have to go out and find John, the wild prophet, and you have to go out and be baptized, and you better start repenting, and you better start showing fruits of repentance, and maybe we can get you turned around on the track where when the Lord comes, you know, things are going to turn. So i got to go out to John, and man, I've got to really, man, I, I have got to get this thing started. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
I've got to go find John, and I've got to do the fruits of repentance. And that is good news, but that's good news that sets up the real good news, because notice the difference with Jesus. Jesus who is the Son of God. I mean, not, not the Son of Zechariah. We're talking the Son of God. Jesus came what? To the people. The people have to go to John the Baptist. You get the radical difference here? It's total difference. Jesus comes to the people and is teaching in their synagogues. The Son of God now. As I've mentioned, John preached... It's good news, but it's the gospel need for baptism and the uh, baptism of repentance, the fruits of repentance, preparation for the Lord's coming, which John preaches as fiery judgment leading to salvation. If you want fire and brimstone all the time, go out to John at the river. Jesus declared the gospel is now fulfilled understand what i'm saying not just introduced fulfilled in himself we i've emphasized this throughout this series luke's keynote one of his two or three keynotes is everything's fulfilled in jesus everything is fulfilled and it is fulfilled among us the gospel is fulfilled now in jesus In other words, it's not what I do, it's who he is and where he is and what he's doing now. It's about him, not me. Do you catch the flow here? (laughs) This is about Jesus. The gospel is fulfilled now in Jesus. Am I going to get any glory for that, by the way? No. It's all about Jesus. The gospel is fulfilled in himself. And he freely, he freely gives forgiveness, salvation, healing, and freedom by his own word. Now, we'll come back to this as we continue to work through Luke, but you know only God can do any of those things I just mentioned. Jesus is acting in the Spirit, submitted as one of us. Nevertheless, as the Son of God, he is declaring it. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He speaks it, and it happens. Now Jesus is telling us, when I arrive, when I speak it, the gospel is fulfilled. Everything's fulfilled. The the whole thing is fulfilled in me. And I can give you salvation if you will come to me. And here I am. This is Jesus' messianic manifesto. It's set forth in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 27. If you're a Christian, you need to be very conversant with Jesus' messianic manifesto. Now let's go to no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Cameron, I hope you are still acceptable here. We love you. you know. Um, but uh, Jesus quotes this proverb, and um, this brings us to best and worst sermon ever. He, notice all the verbs here about Jesus here. He came to Nazareth, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue. Again, he comes. Jesus comes. He came into the world as our Savior. <laughs> he, he, he comes and intersects your life. He comes to your local church. He comes, he goes to the synagogue on Shabbat. He stood, the verb there is literally rise, like when he rises from the dead. Okay? He rises to read. He unrolled the Isaiah scroll given to him. I'll come back to that in a moment. And found, I'll come back to that, found the place where it was written. And he's going to read primarily Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1, in the beginning of verse 2. He's going to stop before the vengeance of the Lord. Very interesting. But he's going to put in a phrase from Isaiah 58, verse 6. So apparently when he's moving around, he's moving around in that segment of Isaiah. Come back to that. He came to Nazareth, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Jewish Lord's Day, on Shabbat. Now, this is not the preaching main point today, but notice Jesus, the Son of God, fully anointed by the Holy Spirit, infinitely beyond spiritually anybody who's at the local synagogue. Nevertheless, customarily, like every week, 
goes to worship with the gathered congregation. Now, if you believe that you have things more important in your life and that you're more important than Jesus, go ahead and say that to Jesus. Because I can tell you when he's on earth, he goes to worship weekly. Now, he came to Nazareth as, you know, it's his custom, he goes to the synagogue, he, he rises to read, but this is his first time back in Nazareth, now that he's this celebrity, and now he's begun his public ministry. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Um, let me make this clear. Jesus is now the local boy made good, okay? He's healing people. People all over Galilee and the surrounding region are talking about Jesus, and he's from our little hometown. They probably gave him the key to the city when he showed up. He is a celebrity. Nazareth is finally on the map. You may remember Nathaniel says a, a, a famous proverb. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth is not. Nazareth has an inferiority complex, you know, and now we've got a hero from our hometown. Yes! So he comes, and they're going to have him teach. Now, they save him for the last, for the great climax. There are two readings. There's Torah reading and explanation or teaching, followed by the Haftarah, which is going to be the, the concluding reading of the scripture. And that's going to be either from the prophets or the writings. Okay? In this case, they have an Isaiah scroll. It, it fits with the name. I won't go into that, but it fits with the name Nazareth being arguably the, the, the root of Jesse, kind of named after and Isaiah prophecy and everything about the Messiah. So he gets the Isaiah scroll, Jesus does. This is, the, this is the great climax of what should be a really great day, a really great Sabbath. We can all celebrate, and we're all in on the great parade. Now, next, we're going to go to the photo of uh, the scroll. If we can show, yeah, that is actually, this is the Isaiah scroll that was found in Qumran Cave, okay? This is a full Isaiah scroll. You see how extensive it is? And, and you know, you probably already know this, chapters and verses are not in actual original or ancient scripture, okay? That comes in the middle, middle ages, okay? So you understand, you, you better know Hebrew pretty well and you better know your scroll pretty well if you're gonna turn to parts of the scroll to read it. Do you think Jesus knows his Hebrew and the scroll pretty well? Yes, so he's, he's moving, he's fingering when it says he turns, he's, he's, he's working on this scroll and as I said, he's going to turn to Isaiah 61, but he's also seeming to kind of move over also to Isaiah 58. And the, the central issue at the end of Isaiah, what we call Isaiah 59, about who is this guy who's the one that God is choosing, who's going to wrap up the whole story and head us in the last part of Isaiah. Jesus is in that whole area. And he reads Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2a. The Spirit of the Lord... It's upon me. He's anointed me. Now, this links us, this passage links us all through Isaiah, all the way back to the root of Jesse, the promised royal Messiah and king is going to come. The Lord says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, that the Lord is going to put his, that his spirit is going to rest upon this messianic king. The servant of the Lord, the suffering servant, is going to be lifted up in the Spirit's power. And now we get the glorified servant, who basically, what I'm telling you is, in brief, all the prophecies about the Messianic King, the servant, the suffering servant who dies for our sins, the one who is God himself on earth, all of those things Jesus is saying, here it is. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to fulfill all this. So what Jesus is saying, I'll go ahead and steal a little bit of my thunder for next week, Easter Sunday, is that someday is today. Someday, you know how we look at the Bible and say, boy, that'll be great when that happens. Jesus says someday is today. And he says, in your hearing, if you have ears to hear, in your hearing, I declare it. 
good news release to herald the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus declares that he is the prophet, the messianic, holy, royal king. He is the servant savior. He is the one bringing the year of release, the jubilee year. He is the redemption and he is the life. He just said all those things. The Nazareth religious people initially applaud, but then at this point, if you like short sermons, this is like the greatest sermon ever. Jesus just stands up and says, or sits down actually, that's the way they do it. That's the way rabbis teach. He sits down and says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. If Jesus had stopped there, they would have put his poster all over Nazareth. Everything would have been great. Because they're figuring this means we're in, we're the special people, the Messiah's from our hometown, and we're all in. But Jesus keeps preaching. And it goes from best to worst in their eyes and their ears pretty fast. No special home cooking for his hometown folks or hometown congregation. <gasps> what? Yes, no nationalism. No nationalism. This is not about <laughs> Israel's return, return to glory as a national power. This is not a nationalistic agenda. This is not racist. This is not about racial, you know, this is not one race being better than another. This is Jesus' good news and his good news ministry. And what Jesus is saying when he starts talking about Elijah and how Elijah didn't help people in Israel because they were under judgment by God, but he goes, off, uh, to, he goes off to Sidon and helps this widow woman who's a Gentile, unclean, and who ever heard of her? From Zarephath, come on, give me a break. And then Elijah, after Elisha, Elisha after Elijah, Elisha, heals not lepers in Israel, but our worst enemy, the Syrian general, who's killed a lot of our boys. And, and Naaman doesn't even want, he, he's, he's, not, he's just wanting to get healed of his leprosy. You remember how he objects to having to get in the Jordan River? And he, he speaks derogatorily about the Jordan River? I mean, it's not like he's this humble guy. <laughs> but nevertheless, God chose him for Elisha to heal from leprosy. And Jesus is saying, God doesn't owe anyone anything. God doesn't owe you anything. Salvation is totally by the surprising grace of God. Do you like to sing Amazing Grace? Do you believe it? There's no reason, and you have no claim on God. It's he who has a claim on you if you're saved. Best, worst sermon ever preached in Nazareth. Um, Jesus is telling these folks, you don't get special treatment. You need to humble yourself before the Lord and seek his grace. And it's going to be all about him, not the way you like it. <laughs> That's what Jesus just said. Best and worst sermon ever preached in Nazareth. The religious people, what do they want to do to Jesus? Crown him as king? What do you think? They want to... What? We're heading into Holy Week towards Good Friday. What do they want to do to him? Kill him. Um, well, what about a couple or so years later when Jesus is in Jerusalem, when he's teaching in the temple, doing his ministry in Jerusalem during Holy Week? They crown him king? Now, he'll get a crown. It's a crown of thorns. What do, they, what do most of the religious people want to do to him then? They want to... Kill him, which happens on Good Friday. And here's the question for you and me. That's Jesus. That's the actual Jesus. That's the actual gospel. Are you in or are you out? God doesn't owe you special blessings. Salvation is not about what you want. It's about God's sovereign grace. His claiming you and making you his, not you turning him into your servant. God can and will save anyone he chooses, including outsiders and even my enemy. Do I want that Jesus? Do I want that gospel? Will I receive it? 
what is my response to Jesus and his sermon as we move through Holy Week? Am I really with the Jesus who went to the cross? Is this for me the best sermon ever or the worst sermon ever? No one after drinking the old wine desires the new for he says the old is good. What's my response? I got two basic responses here. I don't want you to pray about it. Whatever age you are, you need to understand that a failure to commit is aligning yourself with answer number one. And answer number one is this, kill him. Get him out. I like it my way. You can kill him. The good news is, incredibly, he's already died for you. The other option is to die to myself and to live in him. That's the gospel. That's what it means to be saved. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I've died to myself. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live in and for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Die to yourself. Live in him. That's the good news. That's Jesus. He's the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.